One World Training would like to welcome you to the recording of the ITIL 4 Practitioner Change Enablement Sample Paper 1. We would like to acknowledge the official materials from Axelos and PeopleCert Limited. All rights are reserved by them. About One World Training, we are a global training business simulation and training company having offices in many countries such as the USA, the UK, the Netherlands, India, Malaysia, United Arab Emirates, South Africa and many other countries globally. We provide training in several areas such as IT, business management, project management, ISO standards, GDPR and others for individuals as well as organizations. We deliver our courses in five different ways. It can be public classroom based, online from your home or work, e-learning or a mix of e-learning with in-person support for instruction or at the user's location with on-site training for both private and government organizations. One World Training is authorized and endorsed by leading global professional bodies. We have pasted some of those logos of those official bodies at the bottom of this slide. We would like to thank you for enrolling for this course. Let me explain how the exam is structured. This is a sample exam and it is exactly on the same lines, the same style as the real exam that you will attend afterwards. Of course, the questions would be different, but on the lines or the style of these questions, the markings are as follows. There are 30 minutes allowed to you for the exam. There will be 20 questions. Each question is worth one mark and there's only one correct answer per question because all these are multiple choice questions. You need to answer at least 13 questions correctly to pass the exam and there is no negative marking. We begin with uh, these questions, beginning with question number one. Which of the following is correct about change enablement? As I mentioned, there will be four options given to you. There may be some questions where you may have to pick up two of the four options, but again, you have to eventually select one of the four options as the correct answer. And you will understand that afterwards in those questions when they come up. So here, there are four options about what is correct about change enablement, and you have to pick the right one. Option A, change enablement should support various different ways and speeds of managing changes rather than providing a clear standard. B, change enablement should use industry standards to set limits to the number of changes and the time required to implement these. C, change enablement makes sure the number of changes introduced to well-functioning services is as small as possible regardless of how many new ideas are presented. And option D, change enablement makes sure the speed of implementing changes is as high as possible regardless of assessment or authorization rules. It is important that we understand how to eliminate some of the possible incorrect answers. Of course, the exam also relies a lot on our understanding, a clear understanding of the concepts of this practice, but it also relies in some ways how we can recall those concepts. So a bit of memorization of some of the tables in the practice guide and in the e-learning will be very useful. And I will be explaining to you how to go about this properly. And also in the e-learning recording itself for the main course, uh, I would be giving you some additional tips on how to recollect or recall some of those ideas. Now, if you look at option A, it seems to be okay that the change enablement should support various different ways and speeds. Option B, the problem here is setting limits to the number of changes. This looks a bit little odd, so B could be ruled out. Option C, if you notice here, as small as possible, the number of changes introduced that is, which may not be possible always. So C also is a little fishy. And option D, the speed being as high as possible, regardless of the authorization, which is again a bit strange, isn't it? So we could say at first look that A seems to be the correct answer. And in fact, uh, different organizations or even parts of the same organization can require different ways of managing changes and different speeds for the delivery of those changes. Therefore, A is definitely the correct answer. But also let us take a look at where we can find this in the practice guide. So I will be also taking you to the practice guide every now and then to let you know where in the practice guide you can find evidence of the answers for the correct answers. 
I am in this bookshelf tool uh, and you would have access to this as well through your exam voucher. Your exam voucher allows you to do two things, to schedule your exam or book your exam and also to uh, enable access to this practice guide either through the people search portal or through the bookshelf app. So here we can see in section 2.1 purpose and description below the key message box, you can see here the change enablement practice aims to ensure that changes to services and their components are controlled and that they meet the organization's change related needs. Authorized changes should enable the desired outcomes and meet the organization's requirements regarding change through put the number of changes made and the speed of change realization and risk management. Flexibility and agility permeate this practice because they are the key aspects of a modern organization. So this is the evidence of our correct answer that we are looking for. So if I go back to the question, option A would be correct, where we can see clearly that change enablement should support various different ways and speeds of managing changes rather than providing a clear standard. Question number two, which method of decreasing change related risks may lead to delays in change realization? So this question is about decreasing the change risks. A, minimizing the size of individual changes. B, automating the activities needed to execute a rollback after a failed change. C, increasing the number of teams involved in change authorization. D, decreasing the amount of manual activities needed in configuration management. Now, the question is about decreasing the change related risks and which method of that may create further delays in the realization of the change. So we need to pick up the one which will create a delay and which means there are three options here which, are, which will speed up. So option A, minimizing the size of individual changes is a good thing. So that would not be an answer. Similarly, automation as in B is also good to speed up. Option D, decreasing the amount of manual activity is also pretty good, which can speed up. And all these options that I just mentioned also uh, decrease the change related risks. But if you look at option C, increasing the number of teams involved in change authorization is the opposite of what has been asked, meaning it is a method which can lead to delays. And... Uh, because the more the teams involved, the further delays can happen in the authorization. But let's also take a look at the evidence of this in the practice guide. For this, we need to go to the practice success factors. And under practice success factors, one of the success factors there is, as in 242, minimizing the negative impact of changes. And herein we can see, here and the second para, Minimization of risks is achieved by reducing the impact of every individual change, enabling a quick automated return to the previous stable state in case of change failure and automated configuration management. So these were the three options I eliminated and I selected the other one as the correct answer. Now, since we are here, it's good to take a look at quickly at all the practice success factors so that you can recall them for the exam in case that question comes up. So here at the top here at 2.4, uh, the change enablement practice has four practice success factors as reflected in these four bullets here. Number one, ensuring that changes are realized in a timely and effective manner. Number two, minimizing the negative impacts of changes. The third one, ensuring stakeholder satisfaction. And the fourth one, meeting change-related governance and compliance requirements. But then we go back to our question and pick up C as the correct answer. Question number three, which two of the following examples best cover the metrics for the effectiveness of the change? Now, this question is about the metrics for the effectiveness of the change. Number one, was the software update installed successfully? Number two, how many of the change steps were automated? Number three, how well were the purpose and results of the change communicated? Number four, how much of the costs was saved as a result of the change? If you notice, we need to pick up two of these four options. Therefore, we need to have options A, B, C, and D as shown at the bottom, you need to select one of them as the correct answer. If you notice carefully, each of these answer options, A, B, and so on, have two numbers. 
such as 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 and 4, and 1 and 4. So let's take a look at this and uh, what do you think? Give you a few moments to think about the correct answer. So here, the metrics uh, for effectiveness of the change should be generally number four, definitely how much of the cost was saved. It's a good metric for an outcome of a change implementation. And number one, if you notice, was the software update in installed successfully? This is an output of the change implementation because the outputs and the outcome both are important. Uh, measures for the effectiveness of the change. Therefore, the correct answer would be one and four, which is option D. But let's also go back to the practice guide and see evidence of this answer. So we need to go to the practice success factor, as in 241, ensuring that changes are realized in a timely and effective manner. And the question was about the effectiveness of the change. And we can see here in the second paragraph here, it is important that both perspectives are considered and included in the change planning, ongoing control and assessment. And what are these two perspectives? They are listed here above as well as here as well. The definition and assessment of outputs can be used at the level of individual changes. Outcomes are usually enabled by multiple changes and other activities. Therefore, output and outcomes are uh, key measures. And if I go back to the, the previous paragraph, change effectiveness can be measured by the levels of outputs and the outcomes of the change. And therefore, the answer that I picked up earlier, D, was correct. Hopefully, you got the same answer. If not, not to worry. Practice makes you perfect. Number four, which of the following should not be used to balance stakeholders' expectations? A, analyzing how value is understood by different stakeholders and applying that to how the change is explained to the stakeholders. B, creating the capability for identifying the indirect effects of changes across the organization. C, excluding senior customer stakeholders from the recipients of the daily communication packed with the change technical details. Or D, prioritizing technical details of the change as the determinator of success of the change for all stakeholders. Now, the question is about which of the following should not be used to balance the stakeholders' expectations. Now, the first glance here, indicates option A is about the value understanding, which is a good option, which is, is needed to balance stakeholders' expectations. B, the capability to identify indirect effects would also be important. C, excluding senior customer stakeholders from the change technical details to be communicated is also a good option. But option D, prioritizing technical details for all stakeholders doesn't seem to be so good. Why would there should be reporting of technical details to all chain stakeholders? Some of them may not want to look at the technical details, but rather focus on the outcome of the change and just the output of the chain. And some stakeholders might not even give regard to the output, but more be concerned about the outcomes. Therefore, option D would be the correct answer. But again, let's check out the evidence in the practice guide. So we need to go to 2.2 terms and concepts. And uh, if you notice the four bullets here below that, the paragraph, changes that are implemented with technical precision, but which fail to enable the desired outcomes fall short of expectations. So additionally, changes may have unintended outcomes, including negative impacts on users, uh, service downtime degradation and stabilization. It might not be possible to avoid these outcomes, but it is important to control these within possibilities. So the first sentence there, changes that are implemented with technical precision is the clue to the correct answer. And let me show you the correct answer that we picked up prioritizing technical details. So. The reference there is a little indirect, it's a little subtle one. The statement is not exactly that is listed in the practice guide or shown in the practice guide, but we need to interpret that properly to be able to pick up this answer. 